I'll give away that T. This, I just want this part of the curve. So I let T run between this X coordinate up to that X coordinate. Nothing real fancy. Now, you know, there's other things you can do. Um, I sped the curve up. Let x equal 2t, and then I'm going to substitute in a 2t everywhere up here. And then I have to change my restrictions on t to get it to do that, if I choose to go that route. You know, there's all kinds of ways of messing with these. Okay. Um, circles. Cosine and sine functions. Be careful with the x squared plus y squared equals 9 problem because that does not solve to give you y as a function of x or vice versa. Easiest way is some combination of cosine and sine. So I wanted my circle to be of radius 3 centered at the origin. And you can check this satisfies x squared plus y squared equals 9. Now, if we start off at 0, cosine of 0 is 1, so x is 3, sine of 0 is 0, so y is 0, we're starting at the right place. But I want this to go clockwise. So I'm starting here, but I want it to come down like this. Notice that in this quadrant, the y's are less than 0, the x's stay positive. Okay, so cosine of 0 starts out positive as we stray a little bit above 0, and so does sine. So I want the y to be negative, hence I put the minus in. There are any number of other parameterizations. If I want to speed things up or slow them down, I can change the period on the cosine and sine. So I change the period to a period of 1 by putting a 2 pi in front in which case I compensate by, I just want one revolution, letting t run between 0 and 1. Okay? Um, this is another possibility. I can let x equal 3 sine of t and y equal 3 cosine of t. But I can't start it at t equals 0 sine of 0, 0. If I began this at t equals 0, I'm going to be starting in the wrong place. So I bumped up, started at pi over 2, sine of pi over 2 is 1, cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So this gets me starting at the correct <coughs> place. Again, I want it to go clockwise, Sine, if you go just a little bit bigger than pi over 2, sine's positive there. And so the x will be positive. But cosine after pi over 2 is negative. And so I don't need to put a minus in front to keep it negative. So, keep the y negative, so I just let this be 3 cosine of t, and then I run it through an interval of length 2 pi, one full period. Okay? Now, I mean, this one's, I guess, more complicated. It, it doesn't matter to me. They're all adequate answers, and there's infinitely many answers here. You're going to have to have the threes in front of the sine and the cosine. Depending on what you make your angle, 
then that's going to affect whatever the restrictions on your parameter T are. And depending on where you put the sines and the cosines, that's going to affect if you need a negative sign. Okay? They're all correct answers. When we really use this heavy towards the end of the semester, it's not going to matter one lick which of these you do. They'll get you the same answer, but you're going to need to be able to parameterize and do it pretty quickly. There'll be some problems between now and then that they'll crop up, but not a ton. Not until towards the end. Then crank, crank, crank. Okay, this last guy, this was the new stuff. Um, again, this is not the only possible answer, but I do want to get my direction vector. It's I subtracted coordinates my points and here I do want to be careful that I'm going from my end point to my beginning point and in general if I said parameterize the line from 7, 5, negative 2 to 5, negative 1, 3. If I was not worrying about it being just that segment and I was not worried about where I started, I'm doing the entire line, and if I didn't care about the direction in which I was moving along that line, I wouldn't care what order you subtracted these at all. Okay, but if you're just doing a segment, which we will be more often than not, easiest to go end point minus beginning point to get my direction vector. Here's my starting point, 7, 5, negative 2. And if you write your parameterizations in this way, t will run between 0 and 1. If you let t equal 0, you're at 7, 5, negative 2. If you let t equal 1, you're at 5, negative 1, um, 3. Okay. You can alter the speed with which you move along this, but then you have to alter these guys. Okay. So, questions here? Well, the ones like the last one, the restrictions, will they always be zero and one? If you, if it's just a line segment, that's all you want, and you know where you're starting and where you're stopping. If you set your parameterization up to be the starting place plus your direction vector, yeah. But keep in mind, you can always simply check. Stick in t equals zero, stick in t equals one. Make sure you're where you should be. And you know, it's not unheard of for somebody to be subtracting wrong somewhere in here. Um, you want to show your work on a test so I can stand a fighting chance to see what's a silly arithmetic mistake versus what's substantial. That notwithstanding, um, if you make that mistake, say, and you try plugging in, you won't end up at the right place. And in other words, if you mistakenly had d equal to minus 2, negative 6, negative 5, for instance, as a mistake, and you made your z equal to minus 2, minus 5t, when you let t equal 1, you plug in, and your z coordinate's off. Do you see what I'm saying? So, you know, it's always a good idea. You can easily check if, if, if 
you're not ending up at the right place. Something is wrong. Now, I can't tell you exactly what's wrong, but it at least alerts you. Questions here. So I just want to make sure these these guys are okay, because well, I just want to make sure. Okay. Any questions here? Okay. Um, I did not quite finish up twelve two, but I did an awful lot of it. So you guys have questions over the stuff we did. I didn't completely address the intersecting lines, that kind of deal. But questions with finding the parameterizations or anything like that? Problems are okay in 12 to Number 51 on 12 Okay. Um, pass. I, we're going to do that. That's okay. that intersecting okay. and those, those kinds of issues. Although, I'll start with, with that. Actually, no, I won't. But let me start with the example I have. So... <coughs> give you two lines. Here's the first. Are these lines parallel? Because coefficients of the t's don't match up. Um, and they don't have to be the same. They're not, They're not multiple. So no, because the direction vectors are not parallel to each other. So that would be two, three, one, and two, one, three are not multiples of each other or are not parallel to each other. Not multiples of each other. Okay? So, think about it in two dimensions. What aligns, what's the behavior lines in two dimensions? If they're not parallel, then they intersect. Okay? Three dimensions, no go. You got a whole lot of space in three dimensions. And what you can have are lines like this, lines that are skewed. They're neither parallel nor do they intersect. So the next question is going to be, does... L1 intersect L2. So how do we figure this out? You said each of the coefficients equal to each other? Okay, reasonable. So I can set 
2t minus 1, that's kind of a shame I did the 2t there, equal to 2t plus 9, and solve it. Oops. No solution. No solution. Conclusion? No. They don't intersect. They don't intersect. I lied though, or you're wrong. <laughs> because I've rigged it so these lines do intersect. In particular, the point three one negative five is a point on both lines. Check it. When are we at the point three one negative five? for line one. Set two T minus one equal to three. And that's gonna give you what? T equals two. For your Y, Y would then be three times two minus five. That's one. T equals two you get z is 2 minus 7, that's negative 5. So this is a point on line 1. But on line 2, I have 2t plus 9, set it equal to 3, and I get t equals 3. Plug t equals 3 in, I get y to be 3 plus 4, 4, 7, no, something's wrong here. Oh, this is negative 3. 3 minus 9 is negative 6. So negative 3 plus 4 gives me 1, and z would be 3 times negative 3 plus 4. So negative 9 plus 4 is negative 5. That's a point on both lines. So what's going on? Because this definitely has no solution, but it does not mean my lines don't share a point. It means we are not at that point of intersection at the same time on the different lines. So in other words, I may have this intersection, and maybe this is line one, and maybe this is line two. Here's the intersection. I'm at this point. on line one at time t equals two, and um, here via line two, but that doesn't occur till time negative three. So how do we fix this? We fix it by first of all saying, this process definitely will tell me if I have two cars traveling down the different roads and there's an intersection, will they crash? That's, it's going to tell me. Okay. But it's not going to simply tell me if they meet. To get that, I have to uncouple the issue of time from both of these. I cannot have whatever my parameterization of is here to be the same parameter there. Other than that, I'll do the same technique. So I'll copy over line one. I 
3t minus 5, z is t minus 7. And then for line 2, I'm going to change what the parameter is. So I'll call it s. 2s plus 9, y equals s plus 4, z equals 3s plus 4. And do the same deal. But I will now have two variables. So setting my x's equal to each other, I have 2t minus 1 equals 2s plus 9. So that's the x's. The y's, 3t minus 5 equals s plus 4. That is going to allow me to solve for S and T. And once I do that, I'm going to plug the values of T and S into their respective Z components. Let's see, are they the same or not? Which they should be because we've already verified just by kind of looking that the two lines intersect. Okay, but let me let me just run through. Um, if I multiply by three through this top line, um, I would have six t minus three is six s plus twenty seven. Multiply this by two, I have six t minus ten is two s plus eight. And I pray when I do this, I don't do some ridiculous mistake. Um, subtract, those guys go away. Minus 3 minus a negative 10 is 7. This is 4s plus, what is that, 27 minus 8, 19. So subtract 19. And that's going to give me minus 12 is 4s. So s here is negative 3. Just put that matrix. Yeah, yeah. If you know the, I mean, yeah, definitely. Can you just use your t values for the, what you multiply? Yeah, well, I can just come up here and observe that 2t is 2s plus 10. Plug my s equals negative 3 in. So when I do that, I get 2t two is <coughs> 2 times negative 3 plus 10. So what is that? 4. Divide by 2, you get t equals 2. Now, what this is telling me is that on the first line at time two units, whatever the time unit is, I'm at a point on line one where the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate match up exactly to the same point on line two when s is negative three. But I, it doesn't tell me about the z-coordinate. So, on line one, Z is T minus 7, 2 minus 7, that's a negative 5. On line 2, Z is 3S plus 4, 3 times negative 3 plus the 4. And I'm, I mean, I know you can do a lot of this just plop it down, but you guys are taking notes, which is why I'm writing in the detail. <coughs> But what is that? Negative 9 plus 4. That's negative 5. Those are the same. Yes, they intersect. And they intersect at, so, you know, just plug in t equals 2. 4 minus 1 is 3. 
the y is 3t, that's 6 minus 5 is 1, and then my z is negative 5. If the two lines did not intersect, then one of two things could happen. I could do this and find that there's no solution to these, to this linear system of two equations and two unknowns. I mean, these are equations of lines and two variables. Maybe they're parallel. I may get no solution. Or I get a solution for s and t which fixes the x's and y's equal, but if the z's don't match, forget it. There's no point of intersection. The key is that you have to make the distinction between what I did here and what that conclusion tells me versus what's going on here. So that issue of time kind of, I don't know, pops up and really emphasizes that these parametric curves are somewhat different than what, you know, you have to think a little bit, I guess, to make sense of it. Okay? Can you put page on it for just one second? Oh. So that, you know, see if problem 51, if that works. You know, and if not, then ask again. Okay? Um, questions on other stuff in 12 too, because I believe for the most part I've covered what else is in here. In up for that. Can you go back to the other page? No. Okay. If I even touch that little thing that shuts it off, which is a real pain. All right, so we begin now into sections 12.3 and 12.4. Both of these involve multiplying vectors. Um, and this is where life gets weird, because if you just look at what the book does, it's just kind of pulled out of thin air. So 12.3 deals with what is called the dot product. They will, in the very introduction to 12.3, define it for you, but boy, it is not at all intuitive. So what I usually like to do at this juncture is to show you how people come up with these weird definitions. And you know, just so that you see that, you don't have to copy this down. I'll tell you when you have to worry about copying. But I do want to give you a sense of where this definition comes from. To begin with, if I told you V was 3, 5, and I told you W was negative 1, 2, and I asked you, what would be V times W, you know, it would make life easy for everybody if this meant multiply the components, okay? That's not what we're going to do. First, answer, first question should be, why the heck not? And the answer is, because. I can't do anything with it. It's not very meaningful. I can't come up with any physical meaning in any way that allows me to interpret things. Now, remember when we added coordinate-wise? Those were displacements, and they made sense to add component-wise. 
you know, you've got wind blowing like this and other wind blowing like that, and you want to know where is the resultant, those displacements of the wind interact, both their magnitude and direction, and you get that by adding. So that makes sense. But forget it. I don't know what that would mean or why it would be useful. So we don't do that. So what is useful? One thing that could be useful is if I have two vectors, it might be useful to be able to know what the angle is between them. All right? That's a real useful thing. So, if I take this down to just one vector, and I knew the coordinates or the components for that vector, and it was in two-dimensional space, I could find out what that angle is using an inverse tangent. So I know how to do that, and the stuff I'm going to show you now isn't for that circumstance where I actually can do trig to get the answer out. Instead, I'm looking at a different scenario, something where it's not going to be clear what this angle is. So, how do you find angles with triangles like that versus triangles like this? What's the difference between them? Right angle. It's a right triangle. So you can use your opposite adjacent jump. That's no good. What do you do when you have triangles that law of cosines or cosine. law of cosines? And law of cosines is what we're going to use. So the definition <coughs> of the dot product between two vectors is just going to be a rewritten version of law of cosines. And I'm going to show it to you. It's just a bunch of messy stuff, but you should see it at least once so you know that these definitions aren't plucked from thin air. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this in two dimensions, and I, I could do everything in three dimensions, writing this out the same way. I'm just going to save some writing. So here is a vector. Um, let me call this vector A1, B1. I'd have a C1 if it were in three dimensions. And here's another vector, A2, B2. And here is a nice triangle. And here is the angle between these two vectors. And that's the angle I want. Okay. So, in essence, I have components for these vectors, but I can treat them as if they're points. Because what law of sines and cosines do is talk about lengths of things. So applying law of cosines, what I'm going to get is the <clears throat> length of this. Well, that's distance formula between the points A1, B1, and A2, B2. Now, take that length, that's distance formula, so that would be square root of a1 minus a2 squared plus b1 minus b2 squared. Okay? Now, that's the length of that side, but what does law of cosines tell you? It, it, you know, if I had a triangle like this, and this was the angle I was at, if this is A and this is B and this is C, 
Well, cosine says a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine of theta. That's equal to c squared. Okay? Square of this length. And I've got a square root because I'm looking at this length. So what I really want is the length, and that's going to kill off the square root. Is that okay? So let me, probably shouldn't have written that, let me just start below. A1 minus A2 squared plus B1 minus B2 squared. So those are the, excuse me, that's this length. And that's equal to this length squared plus this length squared. So that is a1 squared plus b1 squared, that's this length, plus, this is tedious, a2 squared, this is why I don't want you guys worrying about copying it, because it's very tedious, plus b1 squared, and I think the book probably goes through this as well, minus two times, not the square of the length, but the actual length. So a1 squared plus b1 squared square root um, a2 squared plus b2 squared cosine of theta. That's log of cosines. Okay, now we start expanding this one out and if you multiply this out you get a1 squared which is going to cancel with that a1 squared. You're going to get a minus 2 a1 a2. You're going to get a plus a2 squared. That's going to cancel with this. Okay. The b1 squared and the b2 squared cancel with that. With the b's over here and it leaves me with minus 2 b1 2. So I've wiped all of those guys out. That is equal to minus 2. Okay, let me start flipping this back into vector notation. This is this length which corresponds to a magnitude. The magnitude of that vector a1, B1. That's this guy. And this is also a magnitude. It's the magnitude of A2, B2. Times cosine of theta. You ditch the negative 2's all the way through. And what you get is a1, a2 plus b1, b2 is equal to this magnitude, <coughs> this magnitude, cosine of theta. And then you stand back and look stunned at the beauty of this. Okay, so let me, let me show you what's what's going on here. Let me call this first vector V and this second vector W. The left hand side, that's what I call V dot W. That is the definition of a dot product. That is equal to the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times cosine of theta. All right. Another way in which you'll see this written is if you take V dot W 
and you divide it by magnitude of V and magnitude of W. So you divide this out, you would get cosine of theta. So you take cosine inverse of all this, that's your angle theta, where I've defined V dot W. Okay. Now let me mess with numbers and then I'll start talking about why this is so nice. So, formally, if V is equal to the vector AB, actually we can do it in three dimensions now. If V was equal to the vector A, B, C, and W was the vector M, N, P. We define V dotted with W to equal A, M plus B, N plus C, P. You just multiply the coordinates and add the results. Two dimensions, three dimensions. This can algebraically easily be extended to 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions or whatever you want. The algebra is going to stay the same. This is called the dot product. fundamental underlying fact about the dot product is that V dotted with W is equal to magnitude of V magnitude of W times cosine of the angle theta which is the angle gotten when you place V and W tail to tail. So, you know, if I'm given this to be a vector V and I'm given this to be W, I'm not talking about this angle. Instead, I'd have to pull my W back here and this would be the angle that I'm talking. So this theta is the angle between V and W when V and W are tail to tail. And this, this is going to matter. This is going to kick in at times. For interpretation, so this is important that you know what that angle theta is. Now, let me talk a little bit because this is the most fundamental thing. Dot products are trivial to compute. If V was negative one, two, three, and W was four, negative one, two, then V dotted with W, so what is that, negative four, minus two, plus six, oops, that one comes out to be zero. 